All right. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Sarita Green. Welcome to our AYA, our AYA online webinar. We're excited that you've decided to join us today and hope that you'll find this time valuable. This will not be our only webinar um, as we hope to make this series a live and pre-recorded content that highlights some of the dynamic friends, supporters, and, co and colleagues in the areas of Texas Freedom Colonies, Historic Preservation, and Conservation. So we hope that you'll join, um, you'll continue to join us along this journey, resulting um, in being introduced to new information and, and expanding uh, your network. So we'll just ask that for everyone who is on with us today, if you would go ahead and um, add your location um, to your name. Uh, and what you could do is click on the three dots in the right hand corner of your Zoom box and toggle, and toggle to rename. And then you'll want to list your location and next to your name. And that way we can uh, connect with one another just a little better. So uh, just to give you a little background about the host organization and our IA symposium, both the IA symposium and the IA webinar are sponsored by the Clay History and Education Services. Our mission is to develop education and training programs uh, for for Texans of all ages in the areas of history, um, in the fields of historic preservation and conservation trades, as well as STEM, both as an individual organization and collaboratively with history and education organizations that have similar goals. The IA Symposium is a multidisciplinary freedom uh, uh, or an exploration of freedom colonies in Texas, as well as other Black settlements founded by formerly enslaved uh, members of the African diaspora throughout the United States and the world. Um, so we want you to make sure to mark your calendars for uh, our 2024 IA Symposium, which will be held on Thursday, June uh, 6th on the campus of the University of North Texas, the Dallas campus, not the Denton campus. Um, this year's symposium will focus on the unique histories, cultures, and characteristics of the Texas Freedom Colonies in and near urban centers, especially Houston, Dallas, Austin, and San Antonio, and feature stories of emancipated uh, Texans' migration to these metro areas and celebrate the countless Black Wall Streets they built upon their arrivals and discuss the challenges these communities in Texas and the U.S. currently face. So for more updates on the symposium um, and the webinar series, please visit our website at www.iasymposium or www.iasymposium.org um, and follow us on Facebook at IA Symposium. So with that, I would like to introduce our first speaker or our speaker for the day. Um, his, in 2022, Steve Pine left his 32-year position as Senior Decorative Arts Conservator at the Museum of Fine Arts Houston to expand his work in private practice, Pine Art Con Conservation. Steve has worked with museums, historical societies, and private collections on a wide range of conservation projects from the 16th through 21st century furnishings. For the past year, he has been working at Space Center Houston, the Visitor Center and Museum for NASA's Johnson Space Center on space suits, space craft, and collections related to NASA programs. He is a board member of the Western Association of Art Conservation and is a member of the American Institute for Conservation. He has held the offices of chair of the Wooden Artifacts Group and the Emergency Committee for the American Institute for Conservation. He is an active member of the National Heritage Response Team of the FAIC and past president of Texera. In 2018, he was awarded the AIC's President's Award for his leadership assisting cultural heritage institutions damaged in the Houston area following Hurricane Harvey. He lectures and leads workshops on collections care, disaster preparedness, and response for cultural heritage um, sources and building alliances and networks. Please help me welcome Steve Pine to today's webinar. Steve, so glad to have you here, and I'm going to turn it over to you. Okay, well, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, happy to do this. It's always nice to be able to share information 
uh, with with kind folks that have uh, uh, the need and the opportunity to advance our our, our sense of who we are and and uh, where we've come from and maybe where we'll be going next. Uh, I'd like to jump right into the slide presentation and and uh, uh, explain a little bit more about what the topic is and and uh, um, and, and and flesh this out as 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 we go, I'm going to share the screen in just a moment. Go, and I'll start from the beginning. And I uh, entitled this "Protecting the Legacy: Family Treasures Made of Wood," uh, and it's it's something that that is uh, is is ubiquitous. I mean, wood is just one of the building blocks of. So much of what we use in in our uh, uh, our, our homes and our businesses and, and around, what, what we'll cover today is is the materials used in furniture and other objects made of wood, uh, and th then look at some of the basic threats to the long term uh, stability and 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 uh, uh, usability of those objects, and then touch on some of the proper care of, of furniture and. I might put that in quotes because if you go back far enough in in uh, English language, the furniture was all that movable stuff inside a house. You know, it was everything you used, anything that wasn't nailed down, screwed on, or or uh, built into the into a house or building was referred to as furniture. So I like to approach it as as that. But we'll mostly be uh, uh, looking at things that are that are are used by people that have wood as a major component or a component that still is, is apt to uh, have issues if not paid attention to properly. And for more specific issues of care and cultural heritage materials and art, I am recommending uh, both of these uh, links that I have up on, on the website. One is to a great set of programs uh, run by FAIC that's called Connecting to Collections for their wide variety of, of topics that are uh, 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 examined and resources that are brought to bear and and uh, it's a great way of, of people getting uh, uh, short courses in all manner of looking at, at things that we would take care of in our homes or in museums. And then there's uh, the link to uh, the uh, American Institute for Conservation uh, that that uh, is the, the, the large organization of professional conservators that really is the spearhead and, and the, the wealth of knowledge that we rely upon to um, uh, uh, train people in this and to be uh, uh, leading the way in, in finding solutions to problems. Now, furniture, wood, and so much more. I, I started on a list of what we could consider uh, when someone's looking at issues of having to do with wood, and there's there's just so much. There's solid wood. There's plywood. There's there's ways of decorating it with bone and ivory, or then there's the finishes on top of it. Whether it's a clear finish, it's it's organic and it's it's natural, or it's synthetic. It might be a blend. It's all sorts of things. Paints. All and there's so many ways of decorating and using uh, wood. If you're looking at Furniture, you might be looking at uh, uh, things that have decorative uh, veneers. You might have gilding uh, that's either water gilding or oil gilding. And then there's upholstery with, <laughs> and the hardware that makes all this stuff functional. And if you're looking at clocks and barometers and a number of other things, you might have glass. You might have ceramics added to them. And then you get into the 20, 20, late 20th century. Uh, and you're you're getting other components that might involve synthetics. So plastics and th synthetics might be associated with with things that are furniture. And we can uh, th these can be a wide range of objects. I don't know what people's collections, uh, the, what their family interests have been, what they might uh, think of as as their prized possessions. But there's quite a range, and it depends on where you grew up and what your 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 exposure to to variety of cultural uh, centers might be, what kind of things you pay attention to. 
and I've got quite a wide range of, of things here that that uh, are not necessarily high-end things. Some of them are sort of, but you're not going to find these things in a palace per se, but uh, we're not really looking at helping people, you know, understand how to take care of a, uh, uh, you know, something that would have been presented to a king or queen. I think that the, the things that I need to know about in my home are pretty much the same things that that uh, most people are going to uh, uh, want to pay attention to and to know about. Uh, and each family's history is unique and tells a valuable story worth preserving, whether it's something that's a uh, 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 18th century, 19th century, 20th century uh, way of living and the kind of things you live with, it, it all has a story to tell. And if it's important to your family, you and your family, then it's important to preserve. And uh, here's a, a couple of, 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 of examples of the range of things that, that, you, know, that you might find in Anyone's home who's uh, 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 living in the area that might be uh, uh, interested in, in learning about this, uh, it's mostly things that uh, we grew up with. You know, if we've gotten to that point where we look backward and then think, hey, you know, that was important to my family. That was important to me. It's usually the things that we grew up with and things that we acquired over the years. Preservation is generally proactive and will, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll primarily focus on limiting changes to wood occurring from a variety of, of broad sources of, of, of problems for wood. Light, uh, everyone's familiar with fading, humidity, also mold, uh, drying issues, and there's pests, whether they're uh, little critters or bigger critters. Uh, and Using things, cleaning and handling things is also one of cumulatively, if not uh, from an acute problem, are the, the reasons things become, you know, uh, uh, a challenge to take care of is that we're so familiar with the things we live with that it's often that we don't really consider what's the long view, what's the arc of a lifespan of something that that although something might not seem like it's a big deal to, to handle in one way or another way or make an adjustment, over the years, the decades and generations, you can really change something quite a lot and uh, uh, change that, that story of what it is and what it might mean to you all, or even on a base level, uh, what its value is. So launching right into light. Uh, on this graph that you see at the bottom of the screen, the main spectral colors, you'll notice that the oscillations are different from the bottom and the violet and, and, uh, and indigo and moving up through the red. Each of those oscillations is a way of representing the amount of energy that's there and the energy available in those tighter uh, oscillations towards the bottom in the blues and into the violets and ultraviolet portion of the light spectrum have enough energy in themselves to stimulate bond breaking in a lot of the materials that that we use in the things you know we have around the home that we use in art uh, dyes uh, some pigments not many but uh, some of them are, are synthetic uh, and uh, uh, they make changes in in some papers, particularly things that are wood wood based, uh, so that those things change when exposed to all that extra light. So when those uh, so in, in a museum context, we recognize that, and and coming from a museum background, I'll I'll, I'll speak to it from from that uh, standpoint. Is that uh, that that things that we care for and that are light sensitive will change dramatically over a person's lifetime if not given an, uh, a, 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 a proper attention. And there are ways of mitigating that. I think throughout these uh, 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 headings of light and moisture and such, I'm going to identify what the 
what the problem is and then how to perhaps recognize it on, you know, in your home or, uh, uh, you know, with the, the materials you're working with, and then uh, give some suggestions about how you might be able to moderate that impact and that interaction. Great example on, on this uh, on this first uh, image, although it's uh, uh, maybe not immediately uh, uh, recognizable, the 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 knife box that's up towards on the, uh, up on the windowsill used to sit for years and years on the middle of this table in front of a window, and both the light the 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 knife box or the 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 box that is is above and the light perimeter around the table itself is is severely bleached wood uh the color of the wood is used to be at least for the table still visible in the center there where there's a dark box uh the dark uh, rectangle so that's what the wood color used to look like and being exposed to direct sunlight for years and years, uh, most of that coloration has been has been modified. It's been changed by the energy that comes from sunlight. And it's not just wood. Silks uh, will become brittle in addition to fading. So that the kind of tearing that you see perhaps uh, along the edges of, of the seat back here are, are uh, indicative of the kind of fragility that, that 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 occurs to silk when when they're uh, when it's exposed to a lot of sunlight so in addition to losing the color and and color was an important part of presentation of, of uh, and the, the creation of this this uh, uh, ornate uh, uh, back to this to this seat uh, it also just can't handle be handled much the edges become brittle anytime someone would move it uh there would be a little bit more fraying of of the brittle silk and eventually it tears and you start losing more and more of it so that it uh, if you if if this was an important object to you at this point it needs some serious intervention in order to to uh uh preserve what still remains of that but again perhaps it could have been prevented so a little uh, a little education here about uh, uh, about direct sunlight. Uh, you want to you know, look at the at the the uh, chart down here and the lux level estimates on the left, and give you some sense of of the lux, or we could convert that to foot candles as well. Uh, measures of of light. And by the time you get into direct uh, sunlight at the very bottom, you're looking at 32,000 to 130,000 uh, lux of light uh, that can, you know, illuminate things and 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 degrade things. Uh, when you're looking at uh, going down a, a, a hallway that perhaps doesn't have any supplemental uh, 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 lighting, you're down to 80. So really. You know, from throughout the day, and uh, depending on where your object is in the home, you're experiencing the objects are experiencing an awful lot of variety of light. And uh, by way of, of example, whoops, I think I have this in, in a different order than I wanted. I'll go back. Uh, look at at the difference. Just to, this is a, a a simple rendering of of what direct sunlight would look like as you're going, you know, uh, through some windows or doors and across the room. By the time you get to the other side of the room, it's dropped dramatically. And and sometimes the things that are more fragile, you'd prefer not to have anywhere near direct light. Uh, and at worst, you should have them on the, the far wall, but hopefully not on a not on a wall that that has any uh, uh, a direct light falling on the object and that changes from season to season and throughout the day as, as the sun moves across the sky or if leaves are on the tree outside the window or it's it's the winter and the leaves are gone and the sun just pours right through so if, if you, we're having to be a, make ourselves aware of what the uh what the conditions are 
that 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 we're uh, uh, experiencing in 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 you know in in this regard. Uh, let me see if I can go back one. Yeah, and so these are some uh, some simple ways of being able to uh, quantify how much light might be hitting something. You can go the whole, you know, the the, the more expensive photographer's route, which with with uh, some of the instruments that are on the left hand side, and you can buy some of those used as well, so they don't really have to cost an arm and a leg. Or you could go the, you know, a more, you know, a practical. Uh, route and download an app on either your 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 uh, uh, you know on, on either kind of, of of phone that you that you that you have. Uh, they're they're fairly accurate. At least they're they're better than nothing. And I, I think that they they would give you a good ballpark estimation of of just how high a light level you're seeing on some of the objects that uh, may may uh, be exposed to uh, issues. And there are some old pride, tried and proved ways of being able to regulate the amount of light that comes into, into a room. Uh, blinds, shutters, drapes, and shades. Uh, uh, blinds were popular in the, in the 1700s. They, people were recognizing way before then the issues of, of excessive light pouring through windows. And uh, 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 it, it's something that that uh, uh, should be second nature to us living in Texas and with the bright sun that we get get here. Uh, but uh, just in case, you know, it's just a reminder that there are alternatives and they don't, uh, they don't, you know, keep you from adjusting the light throughout the day. You just have to be a little bit more mindful. So if you're not able to keep something out of the direct sunlight uh, because of location in the room, at least you can modify it at the window at the source. Next category, relative humidity. And it is relative because it's connected to temperature. Different temperatures, uh, uh, the higher the heat, the more, the more, uh, uh, moisture the air around something can hold and that's why it's called relative humidity uh and so they, they, they uh, these can be good and bad issues depending on how how it's uh, how an object experiences that relative humidity high rh or low rh cause certain kinds of issues sometimes large swings in rh can stimulate uh, uh changes physical changes to objects that result in damage. So I wanted to go over uh, some of what those things might be and how we'd recognize those issues and how you might be able to moderate uh, problems that come in that regard. So there's dimensional change. There's, uh, that, that as these things that are organic, wood in particular, uh, uh, absorbs moisture and gives off moisture with changes of relative humidity, uh, it's also physically expanding uh, and contracting so that that expansion and contraction uh, can can be in concert with or not in concert with with other decorative materials that are associated with it or how the thing is assembled, which can cause some structural change. Uh, particularly when you're when you're experiencing dry periods, mold growth. We all are unfortunately too familiar with mold growth uh, being down here on the Gulf Coast, and and uh, uh, that's we'll talk about that. Also, the corrosion of metals. Metals are happiest without any moisture at all, but they will they 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 are they are more stable the less moisture that's around them because that uh, moisture is available to help fuel uh, reactions that that end up eventually being corrosion. And then uh, sometimes uh, relative humidity or certainly high relative humidity can cause certain synthetic materials to age more quickly. So in high humidity, mold grows aggressively in 60% relative humidity and higher. Although I've seen stagnant air 
in lower corners and underneath things and in between things. Uh, uh, I've seen mold grow there in slightly less than 60% relative humidity. But usually that's our benchmark to say, hey, look, you know, uh, if you have it higher in your house, in the room or on the object, uh, the chances for mold developing are, are much, much higher. Then the higher the RH is, the more quickly iron and mild steel will rust. I mean, that's, that, that is, that's familiar territory uh, for us. And, and I'll, I'll show an example of a foam, uh, like the foams that are used in so much of the modern upholstery uh, these days. Once we got to polyurethane foams, uh, there's two different kinds of that. And one of them seems to be the one that gets used most often because it's, it's uh, the, a bit more, more liable. Uh, uh, ages quickly or more quickly when exposed to moisture. So here's an example of, of mold growing on a uh, ladder back chair uh, with a, with a uh, uh, seat that's woven. And, and uh, you might notice on, on the seat there that only half of it is dark and, and experienced mold problems. This is one of the things that, that I try to impress on people that connects to later in, in, the, in the presentation about cleaning is that, that the mold really is, will thrive more on surfaces that have more nutrients. So if you've spilled something uh, on, on the seat, uh, then there's you know, perhaps it was a glass of orange juice, you know, some lemonade, you know, so, so something that has some sweetener to it, that there might be some starches, there might be something else that's there that, that lingers and doesn't get cleaned off. The mold will be much more uh, aggressive in those areas. And I think that that's what we were seeing in this example. Metal corrosion is driven by moisture. We you know, covered that, but it's not just the iron things that, that you might have in your home. Uh, or in, in your collection of spurs here, there's, there's a, uh, uh, a firearm, there's a, uh, uh, a chandelier, uh, all with things that are iron or some sort of iron alloy. And here's, here's something that will you know, surprise a lot of folks is that, that the, the, the nickel plating uh, and plated uh, surfaces, say like for example on, on the, this camera, that have turned green are a, uh, a, a function of, of either the, the this top surface or the surface that it's plated onto. If it was uh, nickel can, can have green corrosion, uh, the copper that might be, the nickel might be plated onto uh, can have blue and green corrosion. So that uh, there, there's a dynamic that goes on whenever, whenever you have uh, dis disparate, uh, uh, different kinds of, of, of metals uh, bound together, uh, exposed to moisture that will cause trouble and cause, cause change over time. Here's a great example of a uh, 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 modern recliner, a chase uh, that has, uh, it's, it's primarily just uh, a, a, a nice uh, fuzzy fabric over top of a, uh, uh, a slab of foam that's glued onto a shaped piece of plywood. And you can see on the right-hand side, the, the, the condition of the foam you know, over the years. You, uh, these will, will embrittle over time and, and, and turn to powder eventually. So that uh, it's, it's driven primarily by, by moisture. So the more moisture you have, the faster this reaction occurs over time and it becomes unusable or it needs to be repaired. Low humidity is gonna cause warping and cracking. Uh, the lid to this card table that's on, on the slide on the left, uh, if you look, you can you see the, it doesn't lay flat. So the dark line, right beneath the top uh, is where the two sections of, of the uh, card table open up. One of the legs swings around and it's a convertible table so that it would become a circle 
the top would become a circle eventually. So this is hinged at the back and it's two semicircles that should be laying flat and originally did. But over time, the, the wood that uh, is the substrate for all that nice decorative pearled walnut uh, is, it has become desiccated uh, over time. And as it, sh is, as, as it shrunk, it started to return back to its original shape within the tree. And I'll try to explain a little bit more of that as, as we go. Uh, the object on the right was in the same family from the 1860s, I want to say, uh, until the 1980s, late 1980s, when it was given to a museum uh, in North Carolina. And it was never in a, uh, never in a, uh, 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 home with central heating. So it had just experienced North Carolina summers, springs, winters, and falls, you know, for, for all those decades. And it was in a nice, comfortable spot with the amount of moisture content that the wood had in inside beneath the finish, beneath the veneers. And uh, the museum brought it into, uh, uh, into the collection, put it in a, in a, well-regulated museum environment of 55% relative humidity. And within a week, it lost the, the large boards on the right, on, on the sides, had lost enough moisture that they started to contract, but they were confined by the structure of how the rest of the case was joined. And it had nowhere to release all that pressure, but to fracture. So it's something that that it, it I was in I was I was in an adjoining room when that when that crack occurred and it sounded like a gunshot went off. It just it had to relieve that pressure, which is incorrect. And here's a representation of of why you get warpage in wood is that it, uh, if if wood is cut on a radial cut, which is on the radius. Of, of the of the circle of the tree, it will, when it expands and contracts as it shrinks over time, uh, it will do it planar, in a planar way. But if it's not through the radial, but tangential, uh, then there'll be warpage. And you can maneuver that and you can coax it to being flat when you first make uh, make the board, make the piece of uh, furniture, but it's not something that will, will uh, uh, stay that way forever. So those changes will occur one way or another. And I won't belabor this, but drawing causes shrinkage. Or, and it that th those changes happen at different to different degrees uh, in the tangential, the radial, and the longitudinal uh, axes. How, how you can keep an eye on that, the monitor and, and moderate to RH. Uh, there's different low cost uh, solutions to regular to, to monitoring your your uh, relative humidity and temperature that you can buy at Home Depot or online. Uh, there's there's on the bottom left in the blue uh, image. There's a variety of fans. I, I, like I said earlier, if you can keep uh, moisture uh, moving, uh, I mean, and 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 the air moving. Uh, even if you're over 60% relative humidity, a lot of times you can you can delay that that uh, that uh, mold buildup, so that uh, uh, if nothing else, just keep the air moving is going to to help an awful lot. And then there's you know then there's ceiling fans, uh, uh, but uh, uh, the next level up is is to get a dehumidifier. But there's a lot of work. And uh, they're more expensive, and uh, there there are ways of making them safe to to use uh, and and not a bother all the time. But they you have to empty them, or you have a hose that's running out the window or down through the floor. And it it, it in certain cases it makes some sense in the in a home. But uh, I'm just mentioning it because it it, it comes up on occasion. Okay. Um, Moderate humidity control issues by avoiding placing wood furniture near or overheating or air conditioning vents. 
because the air conditioning and heating can both dry out uh, wood very, very efficiently. A prolonged AC and heating can, can cause, you know, RH to drop below 30% really easily. And then uh, in the other direction, mold thrives above uh, 60% RH. So use, use fans if you can. Then about housekeeping and repairs, I, I, I think that uh, because we're running uh, uh, short on time, that uh, perhaps I should uh, let you read this again later, but I, I, I wanted to just address that, you know, there, there, there's, there's a reason we respect old things. You know, there, there are many reasons that, that we might uh, uh, want to take care of something. And these are some points about you know, avoiding uh, changing things just because they look old. You know, uh, uh, avoid refinishing or painting if possible, clean instead. Don't use strong chemicals for cleaning finishes and hardware. Preserve original upholstery if possible. If not, then at least document and photograph and take samples that you can have to keep with an object that might be of historic significance. Retain original parts whenever in doubt and uh, uh, retain some associated documentation, certainly if there are labels or inscriptions, so you'd wanna take care of those. Okay, on to care and handling tips. Uh, in general, dust periodically with a soft brush or, or, or cloth. Uh, avoid oil-based revivers. There was, there was a thing going around and you'll still get advertisement for, for a lot of these uh, uh, reviver sort of things that you wipe on. They're heavy in, in terpenoids very often and, and uh, oils, and uh, they're, they're made to saturate the surface and, and uh, make them look really rich. And, and uh, over time, if you add that and, and you're doing that, Every, every few years, yes, it does make it look saturated and rich, but, but uh, all this becomes an accumulation over time, holds dirt very often because it never quite uh, completely uh, hardens and uh, oxidizes with exposure to light and, and, and humidity. So it can look really, really bad. Uh, avoid pledge and, and some of the other quick sprays that, uh, that might have silicone. Uh, and then because uh, the silicone will remain even when the rest of the material has evaporated off. And if you need to do any finish repair work in the future, the, the presence of silicone there is going to keep any new finish from adhering to the, the damaged area. So that'd be something to avoid. What you can do really with confidence is use a Carnuba-based uh, paste wax. Uh, be wax, beeswax, beeswax, you know, you want to stay away from because its melting point is much lower uh, than carnauba wax. So that the beeswax uh, uh, materials when you're waxing your furniture uh, will will stay soft in te hot Texas heat and pick up dust and fingerprints that much more quickly. You know, so I just uh, recommend staying away from that. Uh, here's here's four examples that I just pulled off the internet. Uh, of of paste waxes that have might have a mixture in them, but they're 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 natural. It's a it's a plant based wax. Uh, depending on on the amount of use your furniture is getting, you probably will only have to you know wax to you know bring up the buff uh, and and the shine uh, once every couple of years. So don't have a, you don't need to, to apply a lot of it and it is kind of time consuming and takes a lot of elbow grease. But uh, uh, if you'd like to do that, I have lots of clients around uh, the Houston area that would prefer if I would come out and wax their furniture every every year because they had done that for decades. But I, I, I just counseled them, no, 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 just, you don't need to do that. Just take a cloth and buff it up again and uh, you know, Call me next year if it looks terrible. Cleaning, cleaning is it's 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 going to be probably the 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 simplest thing for you to do to care for your furnishings, your furniture, your wood. Uh, you can use cloths, a, a vacuum, 
uh, the, the brushes that I have pictured down on the lower right, they're, they're a, uh, you can find those uh, at, at a site uh, that, that I, I add a link for at the end, but they're, they're used for, for uh, uh, with, with some Japanese print making and, and, and uh, uh, the reason I, I gravitate towards those is they don't have metal ferrules. If you notice that they're just wood and hair, you know, and, and, and some string, and that way you don't inadvertently scratch a piece of furniture if you're brushing over top of it. Uh, and uh, of the microcloths now, there's such a variety depending on the kind of surface that you have, something that's rougher or something more polished. Uh, you can get microfiber cloths that, that will pick up the dust and not scratch. So I prefer to have those and not feather dusters or you know uh, or the, the, the wool on occasion, but I've seen uh, I work with a lot of furniture that that you'll see feathers stuck on pieces of wood, you know, that were a little rough, you know, and and then I'll see missing parts of of decoration because they got caught in in the feathers or or the wool. So I prefer you know that that uh, you look go carefully. And uh, uh, here's a couple of, of diff different views of, of how, if you were being very careful about something that was very old and was a fragile surface, uh, the, the top image shows a, a, a woman that's working on a tapestry covered uh, uh, a French uh, gilded piece of furniture that she's taking a, uh, a screen similar to what you'd use for uh, uh, needlepoint and just laying it across the object and then you can vacuum over over top of that so that the the, the mesh holds the fibers down and keeps the vacuum head from from getting attached and 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 you know drawing so dramatically that you're pulling uh to get it off uh the the image on the lower left is of someone that's uh, vacuuming a a, a chair that as a uh, modern reproduction fabric, and uh, that, that's in a museum, and I and I know that you know sometimes it takes longer to do it, uh, uh, the the job when you've got to work through a, a screen. But uh, uh, another approach to doing that is to take your brush and have your the nozzle of your your vacuum cleaner uh, covered by a mesh that has a has a rubber band around it, so that again you're brushing into the nozzle, but there's no chance of something being sucked right up into the vacuum cleaner. Okay, then handling. There's care and handling. Well, uh, anytime I, I go to lift and move, um, uh, or even just to examine a, a piece of furniture, I'll look at it and think, now, is there anything that might be loose or have old repairs that are failing? Uh, in general, I'm going to lift objects by the seat or aprons or the part that seems to be the most stable. Uh, don't slide heavy, large objects. Disassemble furniture to smaller components if you need to move something. And use furniture slides under feet if necessary. Here's some examples. Moving furniture. In this example on the left, uh, they're, they're describing, you. hey, don't grab something by the back of the chair. Lift it by the seat rails. That's the most uh, uh, that's where the most support is. It distributes the weight best, and it can it can stand being lifted, as opposed to lifting something by the crest rail, as on the right. And old repairs failed, and you have a bunch of parts in your hand. Now that would go the same for for uh, arms on on chairs as well. If I was uh, lifting something that was awkward and heavy, we might uh, lift it with two people. And lifting from the legs, not the top. This is an old uh, uh, sewing machine uh, table. You can see I said I've got a cast iron uh, uh, a set of legs and support. And instead of lifting it by the edge of the top, these two ladies are are lifting it uh, from the leg support stand. And how might you lift and move this wash stand? Uh, the 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 top is marble. So it's going to add some weight, and the back is detachable. 
So even the, 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 uh, um, the, the ceramic tiles that are in the back uh, might be a little vulnerable should it start to shake. Uh, so I would disassemble that if, if, if I needed to uh, move that in order to get it onto uh, the, the, the dolly in order to move it. Okay, critters. Okay, one of the last uh, uh, issues uh, that, <laughs> that I'll deal with today. Uh, you you got to know your enemies and how to how to recognize them when they become part of your home or start it impacting your collections. The case making and webbing clothes moths eat fast, and they're hard to find because they're photophobic. So they're they don't want to see the light. So you won't see them until you disturb them. For the most part, the very carpet beetles. Uh, that that are on the the right hand side, uh, those uh, the darker ones that uh, uh, in the center, top and bottom, are adults. They don't eat. They fly off to lay eggs, and then that's it. You know. So if you see these little guys, and they're the size of the head of a pin, maybe two, two uh, heads, uh, you'll see them usually at the windows, at the window sills. So if you've got them in your in your house. And they've been living there for a while. You'll see perhaps frass uh, from the larvae that are on the left, the fuzzy guys. They're the ones that eat, and uh, that you'll see the adults at the windows. And then there's rodents. How to recognize the beginning of a problem? Well, uh, you can trap uh, the little boxes down here. They're little blue blue traps. So if you can put those discreetly around a room where you think you might have some vulnerable materials, uh, you, you'll see them. It's just opportunistic for the most part that they'll walk right in. There are some that have pheromones, depending on what kind of insects you think you're having trouble with. Uh, silverfish, uh, carpet beetles, moths. So you can find out much more about that by going to this website with museumpass.net. And they'll they'll help you identify your pests, uh, describe. You'll, you'll be able to read about uh, the, the life cycle of, of these things, where to find them, how to be able to uh, uh, cope with them in your collection, how to how to get rid of them. And here's what that website would lo look like if you called it up on your on your computer. And that's a big, very carpet beetle, or furniture beetle. Uh, that, that's on the screen. How you might also bump into it is you see all the dark matter that's, you, you, there's a lot of red that's missing. Uh, that's wool that's been eaten by, by uh, uh, most likely carpet beetles, the way it looks. Uh, and they are, they are, they're eating proteins. Uh, that's that's their preferred, they, they are nature's way of cleaning up all the other little dead bugs and critters. Out, out in the woods. And uh, if they if they can't find other little critters to eat, they'll eat any source of protein that they can find, leather that's not been uh, dyed with, uh, with, with a certain set of chemicals, but some leathers, uh, certainly all, you know, some feathers, although not, they don't really, uh, uh, you, you will see them on feathers. You'll see them on some silk, but mostly not, but wool. So any wool and furs are, 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 are going to be eaten like that. And the frass that they leave behind is the same color as the wool that they've just eaten. And this is, you can see at the top, it's a, I think there was an overlap of one carpet on top of another. And that that's why you're seeing uh, this activity, because this was out of the light. Wood borers. When you see powder like this and little holes on your on 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 a leg or underneath the uh, seat rail, you've got some wood borer, and uh, they're as small as the diameter of the, the, that's the size of them is is relative to that diameter of hole depending on what kind of wood borer beetle you have. So be on the alert for those. Uh, here's another example of of what. The exit holes and the frass might look like on the left, and an exit hole and uh, a wood borer beetle on, on the right. 
paper and glue. There would be backings of 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 of, of many things, but the proteins, uh, silverfish are known to eat other silverfish and other critters like cockroaches as well. So that they're all they'll all be attacking uh, something in your in your house. So you just the trapping is important. So getting those glue traps and having a clapping a trapping uh, program for your home is is important. And if you find an infestation, isolate the object first. Wrap it in plastic, tape it up, uh, remove it from from uh, harm's way, and call for help. You're either going to go to a, a local exterminator, uh, a pest control expert, or go to that museumpest.net site, and you'll be set. Handling and cleaning uh, other references. Here's a list of, of four different uh, uh, links that that will help you, you know, with, with in greater detail or to reinforce some of what I said. And to find a conserver, you can go directly to the AIC website. It's managed by the FAIC, the Foundation for the American Institute for Conservation. And there's a, a tool there that uh, uh, you can see there when you when you uh, uh, learn a, when you hit the drop down for about conservation, uh, you can find a, a tool there that says how to search and find a professional. So depending on what uh, interest what, what what the material is that you're interested in dealing with and and your location, you can then refine the search. And here's a, here's a, two sites that you can use to find a lot of the materials uh, that, that I've spoken about already. Uh, University Products and Light Impressions, they both specialize in, in these sorts of things for libraries, archives, and museums. So they're, they're, what they sell us is reliable and it has, they all, will all have a history of, of, of safe use. That's it. Just a few minutes for questions and answers. Hopefully there'll be some answers. Uh, thank you so much, Steve. We so appreciate this wealth of information that you've provided to us. Um, I actually have a couple of questions before we turn it over to some of our participants. Um, are there um, certain items, wood items that are worth preserving um, beyond just the, you know, I don't know. It, I know that this piece has been in the family for a long time. When we talk about quality of the product, are there certain items that we should be looking for and making sure that we're preserving? Well, that's in the eye of the beholder. I mean, every you know, there are so many things that 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 we toss out that later on we wish we hadn't, or that if you've gone to a uh, 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 a museum, a history museum. Uh, the kind of things that are are displayed there are often very surprising. They may seem very mundane, but they uh, may be representative of a uh, of, of of something that was indicative of of a period, mm. of a situation, of a, 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 have a historical reference, uh, and uh, the things that that end up in museums like that now are are the survivors, and the reason they're rare is. For the most part, is that you know, in a person's lifetime, you tend to just think, oh well, that old thing. I'm used to that. Mm -hmm. and, you know, why would you know anyone would want to care for that anymore? We can't save everything, but uh, uh, things that have a personal story for you, I think, you know, may have a may speak well, and 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 with some some. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, with some power to to someone else. So I think just use your 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 gut. You know, if it's been important to you, then yes, you know, save it and maybe hesitate before you throw things out. <laughs> you know, or look for a new home for something. Mm -hmm. But that that's 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 one way of approaching it. Okay. Um, when it comes to humidity, are there certain woods more susceptible um, to change due to humidity? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely, it's a good question. Uh, uh, the tropical hardwoods, the mahoganies and the teak and you know uh, things like that, they have they, they, the, the things that grow up in 
moist conditions in, in real dense, you know, sort of uh, tropical conditions. For the most part, they've evolved over time to, to be full of extractives and chemicals and materials that, that provide more stability for them over time. So the things that are fast grown, the things that are that are uh, uh, the pine and and uh, um, uh, chopper and 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 things that that are are uh, uh, usually thought of as timber, more often than not, will be you know something that expands and contracts a, a little bit more. There are uh, resources to 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 find out what the percentages of ch those mm -hmm. changes are per each wood, each type of wood that you can that you can look up. But it, it's it's actually you know pretty rare than anything that has drawers in it or as a mm -hmm. table uh, is made of just one wood. So it's how they play together that 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 uh, has a bit more to do, do with with how well they deal with relative humidity and how resistant they might be to pests. Okay. Thank you for that. And then lastly, we had a question in the chat. Um, I think it was when you were talking about waxes and you know certain types of wax. And someone asked, is liquid gold considered a reviver? I haven't picked up liquid gold in so long that, that I think I'd have to look it up myself. But I think that what, what I usually do is look for the... Uh, the MSDS mm. on something, and it'll tell you the percentages of uh, and and what kind of materials uh, go into it, and that that certain of the oils that are used like that are 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 mostly going to evaporate if mm -hmm. they're like lemon oils and and things along that that mm -hmm. that line. Mm -hmm. uh that the majority of the material is is there just to saturate and make it look glossy again mm -hmm. and that uh it works great and then it evaporates and you need to go back out and buy another bottle you know because it's it's not something that lasts a long time the wax will last a lot longer mm -hmm. uh the liquids are you know ha have that that component and that it's rare that anything is made of just one material Mm -hmm. They add modifying agents to to get a certain kind of look. So I I'd have to go to their to their uh, uh, MSDS to see what it is that that's mm -hmm. in it, and I'd be looking for uh, solvents, and I'd be looking for uh, what kind of oils, whether they're drying oils uh, that will stay around and perhaps be a problem, uh, like the revivers that I am not in favor of mm. uh, or it's just a uh, mineral oil or a lemon oil something that's that's going to mostly evaporate mm. okay well thank you for that wondering if any of our guests today have any questions I have a question yes <clears throat> so um when when you live in a hurricane zone and you have mm -hmm. flood and you have flooding in your house and and this only happened to me once and i'm wondering if we if if the common thing that everyone does is actually the right thing which was basically throw all the furniture away and there was some furniture that um i just went ahead and threw away especially if it, it has upholstery on it some furniture i went ahead and threw away and other furniture on the, you know, the day after, a couple of days after you couldn't open the drawers and things, but there was some furniture that I really wanted to keep. And then after a while, after it dried out, you could open the drawers and everything. So then I regretted that, that I threw away. So I guess I'm asking, is is the conventional wisdom around how to, how to recover from a hurricane the correct wisdom when it comes to furniture? Which is to throw it away? White, which is to throw it away. Yeah, I, I, uh, that, that's, that's something that that comes up often. And because I'm with Texera, you, you would think that that uh, I could have actually uh, made the whole presentation about how to how to deal with with waterlogged, you know, and, and water damaged uh, furniture. Uh, 
you know, I apologize if that's what you were if you were looking for. Uh, but uh, in, in short, I don't want you to feel bad, but it, it, it's on an individual basis. Depends on if it's if something's you know easily replaceable, uh, how much energy and how many resources you devote to it. But in general, things that have drawers, you open the drawers as soon as you can to, so that you can get air circulating uh, through the drawers so that the, the, the moisture evaporates more evenly and more quickly. Uh, and when it's uh, upholstery, uh, I've been able to, to do a couple of things. One is that that if the upholstery is is uh, uh, is antique and original to the piece, then you'd want to try extra hard to to preserve it and not remove it. Uh, and if that were the case, I might first start with removing the back because the backs very often are not the most decorative of of the surfaces. They're less less often seen and very often in a more common material. Uh, but I'd uh, open up the back, either just slicing windows open in the back and, and, and allowing air to move more easily through, through that, uh, taking the cambric off the seat uh, so that the seat uh, can uh, exchange air more, more quickly. But you've got a great big sponge, a great big tea bag of, of foundation materials underneath your, your, your upholstery that is going to be hellacious to to try to dry before it gets moldy mm. you know and that that's always the challenge under the best circumstances yes you can can manage that you can manage that a bit and uh if you're able to get it out uh take it outside and and uh, uh get it in the suns and and breeze mm. sooner than later that's that's fantastic i've had some success spraying a 70 percent solution of of isopropanol and water mm. on surfaces that were that were damp like that and it re retarded the growth of mold sufficiently so that over the next hours and days I continued to do that and keep the mold down and or at bay and, and until the moisture was able to evaporate enough mm. that it wasn't going to be able it was less likely to get moldy in the worst case scenario, if uh, it, if it was his, historic uh, historically important fabric, uh, I would, and I was going to lose everything. Otherwise, I would cut off one repeat of of the fabric, save some trim. This is all, of course, after you've photographed every inch of it, mm. uh, so that you can document it well and then recreate it uh, later. Uh, because once you remove those samples, then you could remove all the the funky, you know, uh, foundation as as well. But uh, it's it's always a challenge. Upholstery is not very forgiving like that, and uh, under the right circumstances, it can be done. But it's it it takes a, you know, some luck and some some insight and, and good hand tools, you know, to be able to make it work. Right. Thank you for that. So, we have we have one last question before we end um, our time today. And that is, um, the question is for buildings undergoing restoration, what would you recommend as the appropriate covering to use for wood chairs, pianos, et cetera, to prevent further decay? If it's uh, a building's undergoing restoration, does that mean uh, new roofing and, and, and the windows being uh, uh, changed out? Uh, what kind of challenges would you have? Because otherwise, I would, I would just be taking uh, uh, some poly sheeting, you know, and and uh, you know, film and and just draping like a drop cloth and just draping them over to be able to keep some of the dust off, but allow moisture, you know, and and temperature to still, you know, freely flow, you know, without uh, uh, subjecting those surfaces to to uh, all the dust and the grit that comes comes from from uh, you know uh, construction work going on nearby uh, yes thank, thank you for that the uh, roof was replaced first so that is uh, secure um, there are windows that still need a, a little bit of replacement um, so mm -hmm. yes air can free, uh, freely flow 
um, in and out. So just drop cloth would be the the, the recommendation then from me. I, I, I think so. You could, you know, otherwise you move everything out before the work begins. If you had somewhere to to put it safely for a while, but uh, there's there's danger in moving furnishings yes. as well. We don't have that luxury because of the you know the vast amount of furnishings in the space. But but yes, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you for that. Uh, there well, yeah, there is one more. There is one oh, more thing yes. that you can do to isolate, though. Uh, I don't know if you've ever seen uh, this, but uh, uh, painters and uh, plasterers very often working in a room will put up a, a uh, clear plastic sheet that they tape to the ceiling and the walls, and they, they'll get uh, extension poles that they can put up to create a false wall. Mm. So you can move things to one side of the room create a false wall that they have these zippers they can add add to the plastic uh, sheeting. And uh, so that you can still get in and out and you can see what's going on on the other side, but it, it uh, keeps those big swings of relative humidity and all the dust and dirt from impacting the whole room. You can just put everything on one side and, and have this temporary barrier. Well, great. Thank you so very much, um, Mr. Stephen Pine of Pine Art Con Conservation for uh, your time today, for all of the wealth of information. We thank everyone who has attended and had really great questions. Um, and we will make sure to make the resources available um, from uh, Steve's presentation so that you can follow up and hopefully you'll be able to protect the wood furnishings that are uh, meaningful um, to you and your family. So thank you again, Steve, for this wonderful presentation. We really appreciate you. Yeah, you're quite welcome. All righty, everyone. Thank you so right. much and have a wonderful day. And don't forget, we have our IA Symposium on Thursday, June 6th on the campus of the University of North uh, Texas, the Dallas campus, not the Denton campus. And more information will be coming out for that shortly. So everyone have a wonderful day.